Hello, my name is David Forrester and I am the author of two local history books based on Fordington in Dorchester, Dorset. One book covers Mill Street, a very deprived area in Dorchester, which was known as the wrong end of town for many years. This area was well known to Thomas Hardy and he called it Mixon Lane in his books. Mill Street, the way it was. Stop whining, there's no dinner, your dad drank it. Shut up, if you want food, you'll have to thieve it. Yes, in an area like Mill Street, women suffered greatly, often blamed unjustly when there was not much food to put on the table. Of course, the man of the house always came first, followed by the children, so often the women went without. Let's start in 1850. At the east end of Dorchester lies an area called Fordington. By the river are houses most in a terrible state of repair, all piled up on top of one another. These houses are inhabited by the dregs of society, thieves, robbers, debtors, prostitutes and general low life. On the 21st of September 1854, the Chronicle reported, at the east end of Dorchester, 1,100 people are congregated in a set of buildings, many of which are in the most wretched condition, utterly destitute of the normal conveniences of life. The population consists of labourers and paupers from this and many other par parishes. Vice, in its worst forms, abounds amongst them. This space consists of Mill Street on one side of the mill pond, and Holloway Row, Cuckoo Row, Standfast and Mill Street on the other. Most of the houses have no ground other than that on which they stand. Consequently, their filth is cast either into the open or into the river or mill pond, from which most people draw their water for washing or even sometimes for culinary purposes. The mere fact that one row was openly called Cuckold Row shows the state of affairs in the area at the time. This was clearly nothing new. As far back as 1848, the Board of Health reported thus, In High Fordington, from want of cleansing, typhus fever has not been absent for the last three years, and in Lower Fordington there is a crowded and pauper population living in the midst of filth. Another report, The Poor at Our Gates, expressed the following. At the end of St George's Road, where Fordington meets its water meadows, you will find the local sewage works. Well, they have to be somewhere, one supposes, and Fordington has been the traditional site for the effluent of the town in times past. There is a certain aptness about the location. St George's most famous vicar, Henry Mole, not only fought to improve sanitation for his parishioners, but was also a pioneer in the development of the earth closet itself. Indeed, Mole had reason enough to seek improvement in public health and social conditions, for his was the largest and poorest of the town's four parishes, and the 1841 tithe map illustrated the crowded nature of the area an area seemingly always blessed with outbreaks of cholera, so the whole area is lawless and controlled as such by patriarchal families whose wealth, such as it was, it comes from the markets and other things it's best not to mention. These families' words were law, and punishment was handed out on an ad hoc basis. However, power would quite often change hands from generation to generation. Nothing was forever. Outsiders were treated with suspicion, often shunned and asked to leave, unless of course a use could be found for them, in which case they often wished they had left. So there we have it. Houses in general have no area outside for disposal of rubbish, which is often piled outside of the houses or thrown into the river where the water is also used for cooking. Floors are mostly built below the level of the river, thus in winter filthy stinking water would quite often seep up through the gaps in the flagstones. These houses 
dank and dark must have been little better than living in the open. Furnishings in these houses was very minimal, even right up to the early 1900s. In his diaries at the end of the, uh, his life, Mo was still thinking about the terrible conditions that he lived with in the, the town at that time, in the village of Fornington. And he wrote once that he was uh, praying at the bed of a dying man when a stream of effluent ran between him and the bed where the man was dying. I mean, that is how bad it was. An outside tap where there was one was shared by many houses. Open drains ran down the front of the houses. In 1854, the Reverend Henry Mole spoke of 13 houses sharing one outside toilet. The only bedding in many of these houses was an army greatcoat. Even in the 1940s, many slept under a greatcoat. Thank goodness for the army. I am told that sleeping was difficult until one was used to the sound of the rats. So much waste was hanging about, it was an ideal playground for rats who nested in the thatch and in the walls. It was recorded, if only the children were as happy as the rats. The rats got fatter and the children thinner on such a poor diet. Lack of food and filth everywhere, little wonder that disease ran amok. These conditions led to many, many bouts of cholera hitting the area, sometimes for year after year. Amazingly, by 1853, cases of cholera had dropped and things seemed a little better. However, that was about to change. By 1854, Mill Street was at the centre of a raging cholera outbreak. For once, much of this was not blamed on the filthy rat-infected conditions, but on the government. In its wisdom, the government, having found the Dorchester barracks virtually empty, with the regiment fighting the Crimea War, took the decision to use the space to house inmates from Millbank Prison, choosing to house only those who were thought to be free of cholera. At this time, it was a well-known fact that cholera was rife in Millbank and the news caused great disturbance throughout the whole town. Mayor George Andrews was duly dispatched to speak with the Secretary of State, Lord Palmerston. However, he was not there. The Under Secretary assured the Mayor that there was a great need to remove healthy prisoners from Millbank and all would be well. History proved him to be wrong. So 700 prisoners duly arrived and were housed in the barracks, bringing with them clothes and bedding. There lies the catch. We can be sure of our facts due to the mass of information in the local press at the time. 11th of August, 1854. All may have been well, had all the promises of separation been kept. However, the powers that be decided to contract out the men's washing. Where should it go? You've guessed it, Mill Street. Soon, the Chronicle reported that on August the 24th, the Reverend Mole had visited Holloway Row and discovered that two women had been contracted to wash the dirty clothes and bedding of 700 men, five articles per man, 3,500 articles to be washed in two tiny cottages with no facilities and where open drains run along the outside of the cottages. I would suggest that even in this modern day this would be a mammoth task for two ladies to do. Mole pleaded with the mayor to have articles removed but all to no avail. Within days, a child living a few doors away became ill and died, followed by 29 more deaths within 40 yards of the two cottages. It appears that although the prisoners had been given new outer clothes, the body linen and bedding all came from the cholera-ridden millside. 
another contributing factor to all this was the fact that warders visited Mill Street on many occasions for reasons best not spoken about. People with cholera exhibited the following symptoms. Diarrhea, colicky pains, dizziness, vomiting, hoarse whispering, sweating, black lips, blue skin and death. Mole had the following to say. Nay, in the very house in which on Thursday the 31st of August the second case occurred, and in which there have been three cases and two deaths, one of these warders was drinking and spending a portion of the night. Well, I think we should move on. Things were little changed for many years, despite letters from Mole to Prince Albert, whose duchy lands surrounded the Mill Street, on the two occasions, nothing really changed. Reading these letters, you can feel the tiredness and frustration that Mole was feeling. The slum clearance of 1912 helped little. In 1905, the 19 years old Alfred Edwards and other town worthies, including Florence Dugdale, soon to become Hardy, decided that only education would solve the Mill Street problem, so they founded the Mill Street Mission. Imagine the bravery of these people to step into such a den of iniquity, and Alfred only a very young man. Gradually, over the years, the dedication of this small group paid off, and the education of people began to show benefits News spread and the numbers attending increased apace. The children benefited in other ways. On top of learning from the good book, they received food, drink and parties and their once a year special outing to Weymouth. The men's club, next door to the mission, was a bit slow at first, many still preferring to frequent the pub after work, this leading to much of the day's earnings never reaching home. This was the main cause of hardship. However, gradually, by supplying tea, biscuits and other food, coupled with games and a gramophone, the numbers swelled, improving the lot of the whole family. The men actually reached home with money in their pocket. However, they were still living in terrible conditions. So in November 1931, A.H. Edwards, Mrs. Thomas Hardy, J.P., Miss E. Williams, Mr W. J. Fair, the mayor, and other proprietors from the town became founder members of the Mill Street Housing Society. Its aim to improve the lot of the poor who lived in such awful surroundings by building new houses and improving those houses which were worth improving. These houses were to be built and paid for by either donations, payment for one pound ordinary shares, or payment of 2.5% loan stock. Backed by the great and good, as they were, the money started to come in, so by 1932 the Society was ready to invite the Mayor and Florence Hardy to the laying of the foundation stone of the first four three-bedroom houses to be built in Kings Road. You will see from the pictures that we show that there are actually six houses. Obviously, the local press at the time recorded the number of houses incorrectly. The mayor's speech, which you will see held in his hand, I have available myself. I was given it by the Reverend Dr. John Travell, a great friend of mine. From here, the society went from strength to strength. There was only one small hitch. Mill Street being Mill Street, as the new houses were built and the occupants moved out to much better surroundings, other families moved into the old houses. Mrs Hardy was forced to write to the mayor, asking that the council would apply themselves to controlling this and put the old houses out of use by using whatever powers they had at their disposal. I also have this letter available, which was given to me by the Reverend Dr. John Travell. 
The general improvement of houses and conditions continued over the years until the early 60s. The occupants were virtually all moved up to Old Poundbury or the park area. Here they were suddenly brought into a totally different world. Flushing toilets, running hot water. However, even then some of them found it very hard to handle.